broken. Okay, so it's uh, we'll start the, the ergodic theory session of the Israeli Union meeting of 2020. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Zemel Kozlo from the Hebrew University. And Zemel, you're more. Hey, thanks, uh, Tom and Tali, for organizing the event and for inviting me here to speak. And I would like to use this time to kind of summarize some work that I've been involved with co-authors about the orbit equivalence classification of Bernoulli shifts. And, and mostly the recent work with Terry Sue. And, but I would like somehow to start by serving what is the model that we're going to be talking about. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the Bernoulli shift model, which the stationary version is uh, one of the most classical examples of dynamical systems. So we're given a set A, which you should think is either a nice metric space or it's a discrete set. And then we have the product topology on the sequences, by infinite sequences and with values in A, and B would be the Borel sigma algebra. And then the measures that we're going to be considering are product measures. So we have a sequence of measures on A, and we join them as a product, infinite product measure. We, and we call mu the product measure with marginal mu n. And in other words, it just means that the coordinates are a sequence of independent random variables with the end coordinate being distributed like mu n. So in the classical model, you will have one marginal and uh, say, mu and all of them would be distributed mu and this is an IAD sequence. And in order not to have some kind of pathologies, I'm going to make the, from now on, the general assumption that the support of mu n is always the whole of A. And the action, which is the shift, is just the mapping of the sequence to the one time forward. So this is, in this model what I, is what I call a Bernoulli shift. And by non-singular, I mean a standard assumption when you want to study a dynamical system, one of the weaker ones, is that you just assume that the push forward of mu by t is equivalent to mu, and this is what we call a non-singular dynamical system. So then the first question that comes to mind is in this Bernoulli shift model, how do we determine for which product measure and the Bernoulli shift is non-singular. And this goes back to a classical theorem of Kakutani. Since mu composed with T is equivalent to mu, then Kakutani's theorem, eh, eh, mu composed with T is a product measure and mu is a product measure. And Kakutani's theorem on equivalence of product measures will tell us that they're either singular with respect to each other or absolutely continuous. And this is, means that the shift is non-singular. And the criteria to determine uh, whether a shift is non-singular is the Kakutani's test. So for the discrete case, uh, what we do is we look at uh, 
we fix the state k and then we look at the measure mu n k square root minus the square root of mu n minus one of k and take the square of this. This is the Hellinger distance between the mu n and mu n minus one when I sum over all the states. And then I have to sum up all the coordinates. And this, if this is finite, this is an if and only if criteria for the shift to be non singular And when you want to consider the uncountable state space, it's slightly more tricky. So we're going to always have the standing assumption that there is one measure nu on A for which all the coordinates are absolutely continuous with respect to it. And then the criteria for non-singularity is the internal sum is replaced by an integral and the values of the tosses at k will be uh, replaced by the radon nicodin derivative with respect to mu to nu of the two measures. So whenever we have a shift, a Bernoulli product measure satisfying this assumption, then the dynamical system of the shift is what's going to be referred to as an unsingular Bernoulli shift. And so this, when you start studying such systems, there is one thing that already differs from the classical finite measure preserving case, is that you don't have necessarily Poincare recurrence so a non-single dynamical system which satisfies the Poincare recurrence theorem, we call it conservative. And the equivalent definition is that there is no set A whose translates are pairwise disjoint and has positive measure. So this is a conserv this is the definition of conservative, and you should recall the definition of ergodicity, of which means non-existence of non-trivial invariant sets. And in our case, the measures are going to be non-atomic, which is kind of something that comes up from Kakutani's criteria. So being conservative is a necessary condition for being ergodic. And you can ask whether the converse holds, and this is not true in general, but for the case of Bernoulli shifts, a result of myself from uh, approximately 1917, and uh, afterwards was extended in a joint work with Bjorklund and Weiss, says the following, that the converse is also true if you're asking about Bernoulli shifts on two symbols. So if we have a non-singular Bernoulli shift where the state space is just two symbols, then being conservative uh, is equivalent to being ergodic. So let me just jump here a bit about what was uh, the condition in my first paper and also the method that's gonna appear later. So in the paper, the first paper, I worked under the standing assumption that when I look at the values of the toss, coin toss at zero, mu and zero, it always stayed within an interval which is bounded away from zero and one. And under that assumption, what I could show using a variant of the hop method was that every shift invariant function under the, if the shift is conservative, it's also going to be invariant for the homoclinic or double tail relation, which is ergodic, uh, which is ergodic because of Kolmogorov's zero one law. So that worked well for those uh, measures with this marginal assumption. But when you want to let allow mu n to approach zero, then the double tail relation doesn't behave so well with respect to the Hopf method. And this was overcome in the joint work with Bjorklund and Weiss where we show that we replace the double tail relation with the exchangeable relation. And we show that every shift invariant function is measurable with respect to the exchangeable relation. And then we could apply a classical result of Aldous and Pittman for an uh, exchangeability of product measures from 1977. So that would imply that the the measure is uh, exchangeable and therefore uh, the, every shift environment function is constant. So that was uh, a very nice uh, feature of Bernoulli shifts that being conservative is equivalent to ergodicity. And then one can ask further questions, which are classical in a non-singular ergodic theories. And one of them is whether there is an absolutely continuous invariant measure which by this I mean that the measure is ab absolutely continuous with respect to our starting reference measure and uh, 
shift and the push forward is uh, the same measure as before, so it's measure preserving. And if nu x is finite, I can assume that it's one, and we call such a measure an absolutely continuous invariant probability, or ASIP. If you recall, the classical example of this is the Gauss map, where knowing that the Gauss measure, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the peg, has nice consequences for a distribution of partial quotients. So knowing that there is an absolute continuous environment measure gives some uh, criteria, and you can ask whether for Bernoulli shift, is there a good criteria for existence of invariant measures? And you should keep in mind that when we're dealing now with ergodic actions, so there is at most one absolutely continuous invariant measure up to dilation, and in particular, if there is a probability measure, then it's unique. So the starting point of this question was in Krangel's work from 1970, where he constructed the product measure on two symbols, for which the shift is not singular, ergodic, he, he had to prove it at that time, and has no absolutely continuous invariant probability. And the way that he showed this is something like the ergodic theorem fails for the measure. That there is one measure which you would expect would be the ASIP, and the product measure that he constructed behaves differently uh, with respect to the ergodic theorem. So this was Krenkel's construction, and he asked whether you have one without any absolutely continuous invariant measure. And this was shown some 11 years later by Amachi, who constructed such a Bernoulli shift with no AC, ACIM. And these type of systems, we're going to refer to them as the type free systems. Um, so that was uh, after Amachi's result, Krangel was the MathSciNet reviewer, and he wrote the following question. He asked whether you have an ergodic Bernoulli shift on two symbols with an infinite absolutely continuous invariant measure. You should keep in mind that for him, part of this motivation for this question is also to understand whether his construction uh, is indeed also a type free system. So that was Krangel's question, and we that was one of the results in the joint work with Bjorkland and Weiss, is that we showed that the answer to Krangel's question is negative in the sense that if you have a conservative non-singular Bernoulli shift from two symbols, then either the product measure is equivalent to a stationary product measure, and then it's as a classical model, or the shift is of type three. So that was uh, the result we had then. But one can ask more refined questions than Krangel's question, and that relates to the notion of orbit equivalence. So uh, two dynamical systems are orbit equivalent. If you have an invertible map from one space to the other, such that the, measure, the push forward of the first measure is non-singular with respect to the second, and it maps orbits to orbits. So that's an equivalence relation on dynamical systems. And in Dai's work from the 60s, the celebrated work, he showed that if you have two ergodic, or it should be finite measure preserving systems, they're always orbit equivalent. So in that sense, there are not, this relation is not that interesting. Uh, but after Craig, uh, Dai's work, uh, Krieger had a series of papers which were uh, but very uh, deep, and among them, he extended the classification result of DAI to all non-singular systems. And he did this by constructing complete isomorphism invariant, which is called the associated flow. But, so this associated, this Krieger classification, it further divides the ergodic type three systems into their Krieger classes, which are indexed by three lambda, when lambda is between zero and one, and when lambda is in the half open interval zero one, then there is an analog of Dye's theorem in the sense that any two type three lambda systems are orbit equivalent. So uh, if, now you should add, maybe it's interesting why the terminology of free. So that comes from the analog of the classification of von Neumann algebras. So Mary von Neumann's work. So the type three lambda corresponds to the type three lambda for, all, for the 
when you start with a non-singular dynamical system, you can build a von Neumann algebra. And if it's ergodic, then it's a factor. And the classification into factor, it corresponds to those letters. So now you have this refined uh, equivalence relation. And when I, after my master thesis, where I construct, show the Bernoulli shift of type 3, 1, and Benji Weiss asked me the following nice question, which is what are the possible Krieger types of ergodic Bernoulli shifts? So this led me to uh, my first uh, classification paper, which was uh, refined by Danilenko and Lemanchik some three years later. And uh, this correspond to the, I looked at all the type of constructions that were known up to that time to be conservative and ergodic, and these are the half stationary models. So these are models where there is one, one coin toss, which is the same for all negative times. And I showed that if uh, the shift is conservative, then either it's equivalent to a stationary product measure, which I denote by P to the Z, or it's of Krieger type free one. So uh, if you don't know what the classification to Krieger types, I'm going to do it slightly later. But at the moment, I'm just staying with the letters. Uh, the definition is not too illuminating. Uh, in the joint work with Bjorkland and Weiss, we, what we uh, wanted was to remove this sta half stationary assumption. And we did that, we did that uh, in the following sense, that if we have some P, which is not zero, which is a limit point of mu and zero, then either we're equivalent to P to the Z or the Krieger type is uh, free one. So this extends the previous work in two directions. That first of all, it doesn't need to have to be the same uh, going the same measure going to one direction. But secondly, we, we're also allowing other limit points, which includes zero as a limit point, and that's not possible in the first model. And the remaining mystery, when you look at Bernoulli shifts on two symbols, is the case when the shift is conservative and the limit is zero. So zero is the only limit point. And we have, we know it's a non-empty class. We have type three one examples, but we don't know uh, if all of these measures are type, correspond to type three one shifts. But the joint work with Bjorkman and Weiss shows that it's always ergodic and type three. So it cannot, it cannot be an infinite invariant measure and it cannot be, it cannot have a finite up to the continuous invariant measure. So that, with that, I, it, it seemed that the classification is almost uh, concluded. And it came as a surprise when I worked with stereo and factors of Bernoulli shifts, that when one goes to a countable state space or the interval zero one, then the result is remarkably different. So the result is whenever, whatever lambda you choose in the half open interval zero one, there is a sequence of measures on A, if A is countable or uh, the interval zero one, uh, such that the shift that we get is of Krieger type three lambda. And when we concluded this work, I sent an email to uh, my collaborator Vase, and he, showed, he told me that the, him and his student, they also uh, are working on a similar problem. They have also constructed an example, which is free zero and to infinity. So at the moment, the answer to Weiss's question is that all Krieger types are possible, but one has to go to an countable or uh, infinite, infinite state space. So also for the example of Baron Schutt and Weiss, they also have countable state space? Yeah. For them, it's the. For them, it's uh, they they do this via extending some works on the permutation group. So it's always uh, th they have some condition, and that condition cannot be satisfied for finite state space. So so it it, it will only be it's not explicit in their statement, but if you go through the condition, then you can see that it cannot happen on finite state spaces. Okay. Uh, 
So let me show you the definition that of this product measure, which is remarkably simple. So let's do it on the interval zero one. So given a lambda, what we do is we we just choose two a decreasing two decreasing sequences of intervals, which are pairwise disjoint, satisfying the following condition: just for every integer n, the measure of a n, the big measure of a n, is like one over lambda to the big measure of b n. And then you have to specify what you want it to be asymptotically like. We chose one over n log n, and that corresponds to having. Uh, it, it comes when one wants to prove that the shift that we construct is conservative. So that's the reason we chose this sequence. Uh, for, and then we do a half stationary construction. So for every negative time, uh, we just take mu n to be the Lebesgue measure. And for positive time, we take a measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. And the density is just lambda on a n, one over lambda on b n, and one on the remaining parts. So if you look at this uh, ratio of uh, masses between a n and b n, it just comes in order that f n is a probability density. And the claim is that the construct this product measure is ergodic and of Krieger type free lambda. And one of the reasons we chose this type of construction is that we could also show that it has as a finitary factor all the uh, stationary Bernoulli shifts. So that was in, in that case. Uh, th these kind of systems they have also nice. Uh, properties in terms of factor. Yeah. So uh, let me now explain uh, what is meant by the type 3 lambda and how we approach the proof. So the first definition is the ratio set definition. We have an ergodic invertible non singular system. And when I'm going to write t prime, I mean the Radonikodin derivative of m composed with t with respect to m. So a number r is an essential value. If for every set of positive measure, n epsilon, which is a scale of an approximation, we have an integer time such that the set of points in A, which will return to A at time n, and the Radon-Nikodin derivative, its log, is close to r up to epsilon is a set of positive mass. And the Krieger ratio set is just a set of all essential values, and we denote this by R of t. And so then what it means to be free one is just that R of t is the whole of R, and to be free lambda is just that R of t is a multiple of the integers by uh, log lambda. And when one thinks about this essential value condition, you should think, wh where does it come from? So it comes from a, a construction that Marham did, which is now called the Marham extension. So whenever we're given a non singular transformation, we can extend it to a skew product, which is by the logarithm of the radon nikodin derivative. So it's a skew product on R, it's an R extension. And when we do this extension, that was the motivation of Maram, then what she showed is that uh, it preserves a natural measure on x times r, which is just given by, on product sets, by the new measure of the first coordinate and the integral of e to the t dt on the second one. And this is an infinite measure. So this is, so Maram's construction is a functor from non-singular systems to infinite measure preserving systems. And the equivalent definition of being type free one is to say that the Marum extension is ergodic with respect to this measure. Yeah. Okay, so now we want to use an analog of this for type free lambda. And then you should see the first thing that comes in this special formula for the radon nikodin derivative. It's when one looks at the derivative of the shift, so Kakutani's theorem gives us a formula, and the formula would tell us that the derivative of the n iteration of the shift is just taking the density shifted by n, 
divided by the density by the density at point k and evaluated at the relevant coordinate xk. So it's a ratio of two densities and each one of these densities takes values one lambda or one over lambda. So as a consequence you'll see that the, the Radon-Nikodin derivative is always uh, takes values in lambda to the integer powers because of the special formula of the construction. So if if you look back at the definition of the ratio, the ratio set, that will already imply to you that the ratio set is con contained in log lambda times z, and in particular, you cannot be type 3, 1, for example. But when you want to really evaluate the ratio set directly for the shift, it's kind of a difficult task. And one of the reasons is that the radon nikodin derivative is an infinite product. And the other reason is that if someone gives me when one wants to check the ratio set condition, you check it on nice sets, which here are the cylinder sets. If someone gives me a very long cylinder, it fixes this definition and, and I have to somehow correct it in order to uh, get the value I want. And that will correspond to having very thin, uh, ver very thin success, which is not convenient to approximate other sets. So we have to do it for all sets. We can do something for cylinder and it's hard to pass from them, uh, sorry, to the whole of the sets. So that case, what we, can, what we do is we do the previous reasoning. We look at the Marum extension of the shift, but instead of taking, because it takes values in lambda, we can take the log of lambda and it's now a Z extension. And we can replace the, the previous measure by a weighted counting measure on Z. And in that case, you know that it's free lambda if and only if this discrete Marum extension is ergodic. And the way that we prove this is we go to a different group action. So the group action that we do is we go back to the group of finite permutations, which act naturally on this product space by non-singular transformations. And it acts by just shifting the coordinate according to the permutation. And because the permutation changes only finitely many symbols, it's clearly non-singular. And you can check that the radon nikodin derivative uh, is as written below. And you should keep in mind that this product now is not an infinite product because it's one except finitely many coordinates. And this type of action is much more better understood than the shift. Uh, when it's two symbols, then Aldrich and Pittman show that if it's non-atomic, then it's always ergodic. And uh, the operator theory is for should ask when Yeah. Okay. John? So they classify the previous types of the permutation action. So, so this is kind of a better understood group. And when you look at the countable set or the interval zero one, then being exchangeable or the ergodicity of this action is more subtle, but there are several sufficient conditions. Among them is the thingness condition, which was introduced by Aldous and Pittman, which, which is kind of a borel cantelli type uh, condition. Okay, so, so this is the permutation action. We should ask how does this relate to the shift action? And it relates by the notion of asymptotic pairs. So now we're given, suppose we're given a dynamical system acting on a standard measure space and some metric, which is compatible with the Borel structure. So a countable group acts on this space by asymptotic pairs on the S asymptotic pairs. If whenever we choose gamma from the group, and we start shifting almost every, for every, almost every point X in X, we start shifting X and gamma X by S and eventually we cannot distinguish between them. The limit goes to zero in the metric. And this notion was related by the Hopf method of, in my first paper and then refined by Danilenko, uh, which is the Hopf method for non-singular dynamical systems. So we have any dynamical system, we have a countable group acting on the space by asymptotic pairs. And then we need some condition on the radon nikodim derivative. So for almost every x, I have some const constant which will depend on x and gamma. 
such that for all integer times, the ratio of the Radon-Nicodin derivative at gamma x and the Radon-Nicodin derivative at x is bounded between these two constants. If we have this condition, then we show that every S invariant function is gamma invariant. Okay, so this brings me to the permutations. So in the permutation, it's an action by shift asymptotic pairs, and which is easy to show, and it satisfies the condition of the previous theorem. So every shift invariant function is permutation invariant. The densities we constructed are uniformly bounded, and uh, you could check that it satisfies the aldous pittman condition, and therefore the permutation action is ergodic, and that and as every shift invariant function is permutation invariant, this also implies ergodicity of the shift. And when one wants to go further to uh, the Krieger classification, one needs to prove that the Marum extension is ergodic. And this is done by showing that the action of the Marum, the Marum extension of the permutation is an action by shift asymptotic pairs of the Marum extension of the shift. However, this is an infinite measure preserving transformation and not finite, so it's not directly uh, applied by the method, by the theorem I said before, but a, an extension of it, which was recently done by my student Abraham Rehm, shows that every Marum invariant function is also invariant for the Marum extension of the permutation action. So then what we all, all we need to do show is that the permutation action is of type three lambda, and this is done in the uh, paper we saw, it's somehow, somehow much simpler than the pre-1 case. Okay, so I slightly overstepped my time, so I'd like to thank you, and uh, uh, if you can stop here. Okay, thank you, Zema. Uh, any questions from the audience? I got a question. Can you hear me? Yes, John. Uh, the, the, the example you started off with, you had two sets, two intervals, a n and b n, and they had measure one over n log n. Yeah. And then you got that it was three lambda, right? Yeah. So what would have happened if it would have had measure one over n? Uh, it will also be three lambda, but uh, what you would get is that it has finite ergodic index, and our example have infinite ergodic index, uh -huh. and also infinite ergodic index for the Marum extension. So you could take one over anything. I mean, the, the, the squares of the measures, the sum of the squares of the measures have to converge, right? Uh, there, there are two things you need to do. The first thing you need to make sure that Takutani's criteria tells you that you are not equivalent to the, just the product of the Beck measures. So yeah. You have to verify that the sequence uh, doesn't uh, decay too quickly. And secondly, you need to check the conservativity criteria, which is done by a second order method. Uh, for one over n, it works, but if you take other sequences, it might not. So if it's at one over n to the three quarters, it wouldn't work? I have, I have to check. I can't say it's, it's a calculation. Okay. You, you, it's a technical assumption. OK, fine. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? So just a small question. Um, you stated the first result for a Bernoulli shift where the alphabet is zero or one, right? For two letter alphabet. Yeah. Now, is, is there, is that any significant? Is there any theorem where it's different result or it's not as easy to prove if you have like a five letter alphabet or? So my student, uh, Nachi, he did a, a work on a Markov chains supported on topological Markov shifts. And one of the things he can prove under the Devlin condition. So under the condition I stated before, and uh, that uh, the, the marginals don't, don't approach uh, zero or one, then you can extend this to any finite uh, alphabet. And I would think that uh, extending it to 
the other the other part of finite alphabet is technically maybe difficult, but it's it should be the same result. And then there was some kind of use of Capitani's theorem that would be more technical if you had many symbols. Okay, anyone else? Okay, uh, so in that case, for those of you who joined uh, a little later, uh, our second speaker uh, informed us in the last minute that uh, he is unable to attend due to uh, technical issues. Uh, so we'll have a longer break. You're welcome to attend uh, other sessions in between or whatever. I, I will leave the session open in case you want to discuss. And we resume for the third talk with Erez. And I believe that's at uh, 3.35, the correct tally? Yes. Okay, so we stop the recording now and resume the uh, pause the recording. Thank you. Um, do you see, so the background is uh, too, too light or? Uh... I'm not sure if I can do anything about this. It's fine. I think it's fine. <laughs> so we should wait for a few more minutes. Okay, sorry for not being able to join you. Uh, but I will be able to join you for the next talk. Oh, yeah. The talk after my after mine. You can view the recording of uh, Zemel's talk later. It's been recorded.
Okay, so I think we can start. No? <laughs> so uh, we're happy to have Erez Nesherim from Huji. We'll talk about homogeneous flows and approximation by algebraic numbers. Thank you, Tali, and thank you, Tom, for the opportunity to speak here. And thank you for coming. Um, so I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, Victor Beresnevich and Lei Yang. Um, uh, so, um, the basic uh, one of the well, a good starting point for uh, the Erfenthal approximation is uh, Dirichlet theorem. So. Uh, which says that for every real number and every positive uh, integer Q, there exists uh, a denominator smaller than Q and uh, the rational number with a denominator such that it approximates X uh, better than uh, one of uh, Q times Q. So uh, Two reasons that this is a, a good uh, starting point is that uh, the, the proof is very easy and, uh, and also it gives the best, uh, the best possible result. So um, a, corollary, a corollary of uh, the Rikle theorem is that uh, every irrational number has infinitely many uh, approximations that are uh, better than one over the denominator uh, squared. And, uh, but there are badly approximable numbers. So there are, there are numbers such that um, it's such that uh, they don't have approximations that are uh, better than uh, a constant over uh, the denominator squared. Um, so an example, a famous example for, for badly approximable numbers, uh, is uh, our uh, um, algebraic numbers of degree two. And it is, it is a famous open problem that uh, algebraic numbers of degree bigger than three shouldn't be badly approximable. So they should be well approximable. And in this talk, I'm not going to talk about this uh, open problem at all. I'm, I'm going to do a, a different thing. I'm going to talk about approximating uh, real numbers with algebraic numbers. So not uh, nothing about approximation of, uh, well, it, yeah. It's not going to, to say anything about approximation of algebraic numbers uh, with rational. Okay, so, so here, is the, here is the problem. Uh, we are now trying, the problem is about uh, trying to approximate real numbers with algebraic numbers. Um, and similarly to what we had before in, in approximation by rational, we're trying to do it efficiently. So uh, um, using some, some height on of the algebraic numbers and trying to approximate it uh, uh, better as the algebraic number becomes uh, more complicated in, in terms of the height. So the definition of the, for the height that I'm going to use is the naive, the naive height. So just the, the absolute value of the, the maximal absolute value of the coefficients of the uh, minimal polynomial of the algebraic number. So um, if we think of rational numbers uh, with denominator, of rational numbers as algebraic numbers with uh, of degree one, then this is just uh, uh, this generalizes the the the, the notion of uh, approximation with the rational numbers. Well, uh, generalizes the, the notion of uh, of the denominator, the absolute value of the denominator. So here is a, a remark. So there are there are uh, some easy facts and. Otherwise, um, it's, uh, it's not so easy, at least for me. I, I'm not uh, 
an expert uh, in this field, but uh, how, how well can you, can you uh, expect to be able to approximate with, uh, with algebraic numbers? So the easy fact is that uh, if, uh, if P is the, poly is the minimal polynomial uh, of alpha, then you can try to evaluate, um, and if you are trying to approximate X, then if you evaluate P at X, then it's, uh, since uh, P vanishes in alpha, uh, you just, you're just using the, the Taylor expansion and you, you find out that uh, uh, the value of P at, at X is, uh, is uh, smaller than, up to a constant uh, smaller than the distance of X to alpha uh, multiplied by the, uh, derivative uh, of the polynomial at, at, uh, at alpha, of the minimal polynomial of alpha at alpha. So uh, since uh, taking derivatives uh, is, uh, okay, it's not doing much to the coefficients of the polynomial, then um, we have also the other, uh, the other part of this inequality. So if you are trying to approximate uh, x by a, by a, by an algebraic number, then you cannot you cannot expect uh, to get uh, better approximations uh, or to get approximations that are better than the value um, of the polynomial at x uh, divided by the height of the polynomial. So this brings us to to a different uh, a different way to to quantify to approximate uh, <coughs> uh, or uh, di a different kind of approximation that is related to uh, approximation by algebraic number. So, which is, uh, yeah, that just to try to approximate, to try to find integer uh, combinations of powers of X that, uh, that are small. Uh, that, that will be small with respect to, okay, the, the absolute value of the coefficients that you're using. <coughs> and here there is, for this type of approximation, there is a, a, a simple uh, generalization of, of Dirchle theorem. So this is just to remind you what uh, Dirchle theorem was if if I multiply B with Q and, and replace P with the minus P. And then uh, you can do this uh, in higher dimensions as well. Um, so for any D dimensional vector, uh, you can find uh, in any, um, in any bound on the, on, the, on the numbers that you want to use, you can find the D numbers, uh, well, a linear combination, combination of this, uh, the coordinates of the vector, such that uh, uh, it would be smaller than one over, uh, well, this bound Q to the power uh, D. So here is a simple, well, a linear combination for, for which not all the, not all the, Q, all the Qs are, uh, are zero. So here is a, uh, a, a simple proof of, of this fact, just to, to fix some notation. <clears throat> so you take your uh, real vector and you plug it in uh, this unipotent uh, matrix. And then you look at the, at the unimodular lattice uh, ux times uh, z d plus one. So by Minkowski contact body uh, theorem, there is a, a non-zero point, a non-zero integer point Um, well, uh, yeah, there is a non-zero integer point uh, in in, the, in in this box because uh, this box has uh, has volume uh, two to the power uh, d plus uh, d plus one. And if q if q is bigger than one, then it also makes sure that uh, that the tuple was not zero. That uh, okay. Yeah. Q1 to QD. We knew that uh, not all of the 
all of the coordinates were zero, but we wanted uh, just uh, to make sure that Q1 to QD is not zero. Okay, so, so we have the same corollary as before um, about uh, infinitely many approximations that are uh, uh, as good as uh, the maximum the maximum over uh, over the absolute values of the coefficients to the power d and uh, it gives us a natural uh, notion of uh, of what 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 is a, a badly approximable vector <coughs> Well, yeah, you, you may say uh, badly approximable by, uh, by rational uh, hyperplane, by rational uh, affine hyperplane, because here we are trying to approximate uh, uh, the vector x1 to, to xd by finding a rational hyperplane uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, that it lies, it lies close to a rational, hyper, rational affine hyperplane. Um, so by, by the remark above, uh, if you are trying to approximate, uh, if, you, if you plug in into this uh, definition, the vector, uh, the vector of powers of x, Then you get uh, you get a lower bound on on how well you can approximate uh, x by by uh, algebraic numbers of degree of degree d. Um, so so here is what we proved, and then I, then I'll say uh, what was known uh, about these. Uh, about this uh, badly approximable, uh, well, vectors that are powers of uh, the same real number, uh, of, of a real number uh, that are badly approximable. So what we proved is that there exists uh, such a badly, there exists uh, a number such that it is badly approximable by algebraic numbers of any degree. Um, Really, we proved the, we proved the, we proved it in the in the way well using the approximations of the vectors of uh, the vectors of uh, powers of uh, the number. So, so really, we proved that there exists uh, a number such that all those vectors uh, for every d are badly approximable. Um, but this leaves. Uh, yeah, this leaves uh, two natural open open problems uh, about uh, how uniform is the constant of approximation in this uh, in this statement. So, is there a a, a number a transcendental number that is uh, badly approximable by algebraic, uh, but uh, with the constant being uh, uh, uniform for all the degrees. So here the first here the first problem is uh, is easier than the second problem because uh, because the second problem implies uh, like we like we've seen before implies the first the first. What if we had a, a number satisfying the the condition in the second uh, open problem? Then it would it would also satisfy the the first the the thing that the property that is in the first open form. Um, okay, so, and, uh, okay, so here, so, so for those of you who, I don't know uh, if if there was uh, if there is anybody who who heard me give a talk about this uh, before, but uh, I used to call this uh, type of a number um, that satisfies this property um, the most transcendental transcendental number, uh, 
uh, just because uh, it is uh, as far as possible from from all algebraic numbers. But now that I uh, have uh, that I thought about this a little bit more, it should be called uh, really uh, the most algebraic transcendental number because uh, algebraic numbers uh, um, push each other. So uh, if you are uh, as as far as possible from algebraic numbers, but you're not algebraic, so uh, this is as close as possible to, to being uh, algebraic. Okay, so what was what is uh, a bit about the history of uh, of uh, this problem? So um, there were uh, for every for every d, there is an explicit example of uh, a badly approximable uh, vector uh, that you can make out of powers of of a number and. Uh, this is just if if uh, if, this, if this condition that uh, uh, is satisfied that uh, x and its uh, powers and its d powers uh, span um, uh, a field a field extension of q that is uh, of degree d, then uh, then x is badly approximable uh, by algebraic of degree d. Uh, hopefully. Is this the same as saying that uh, x doesn't vanish by a rational polynomial by a polynomial with rational coefficients of degree d or less? Does this mean that uh, these, uh, that x is algebraic of degree d? Yes. Not uh, either. It's d plus one numbers, and the span is only d. Ah, oh, only d. Sorry, d. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is something fishy here. So just a sanity check. Uh, when d equals uh, two. Uh, we talk about, let's say, square root of two, and it spans uh, a degree two expansion of over uh, over q. Yes, yeah, so so this should be d minus one here. Uh, thank you. O hopefully, this this makes more sense now. Um, but those are just uh, yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't see all your faces. I only see Tom, uh, Tali, and uh, sometimes Elon. Um, so this just gives uh, countably many uh, the examples of badly approximable vectors, and they are certainly not badly approximable by, by all algebraic numbers, because uh, like like Tom just said, if, if you are algebraic of degree d, then just, uh, of course, there is an integer polynomial that uh, that makes you, that uh, is, uh, makes you being close to vanish, actually, it makes you vanish. So, uh, so those are not the kind of uh, examples that uh, will help us uh, find uh, an, a number that is badly approximable by all algebraics. And then there was uh, uh, a question posed by, by Davenport in 64 about even finding uh, one such example. He, he well, he, he phrased it in terms of finding uncountably many uh, numbers such that uh, x, x squared is badly approximable, but really I think uh, he just wanted an example that is not the, of the type uh, of the explicit construction that was known. Um, so this this was a hard problem, and it was solved uh, 50 years later by uh, Batziachin and Velani, uh, who proved uh, that uh, whenever you have uh, a non-degenerate curve, 
let's say, uh, a function, a C2 function <coughs> from an interval to uh, a real function from an interval to, to R such that uh, uh, the second derivative doesn't vanish uh, in some point, then uh, there are many uh, numbers for which uh, x comma fx is, is badly approximable, is, is a badly approximable vector. In fact, uh, there is uh, the house of dimension of those uh, numbers is one, so in particular it is uncountable. And then uh, a bit after the afterwards, uh, this was generalized by uh, Beresnevich to higher dimension. So whenever you have a, a non-degenerate uh, smooth, uh, well, smooth curve, uh, smooth enough, then uh, it has many badly approximable vectors on it. Um, so what's uh, what's new about well how? Okay, so. Uh, let me show you some pictures before I, uh, before I start uh, describing uh, our work. So, so uh, our in in my eyes, uh, our work, uh, the current work, makes makes uh, this proof uh, becomes uh, e become uh, easy and uh, without uh, unnecessary. Uh, computations or uh, without too many computations that would make it actually evident and uh, clear why uh, why there are so many algebraic numbers uh, badly approximable vectors on on those uh, curves which uh, which uh, didn't which was not the case uh, with the previous proofs which were uh, rather uh, complicated and uh, involved a lot of computation so i want if i have time i don't know exactly how much time i have ah I have uh, 10 more minutes, maybe, at most. So uh, if I'll have, uh, if I'll get there, then I'll show you, I'll try to show you how to prove using our method. Uh, um, just the simplest, uh, the simplest, the simplest case. Uh, of uh, badly approximable um, vectors on the parabola. So maybe I should say uh, something about this, uh, about the connection between uh, this current theorem, this, this uh, theorem of Beresnevich and, uh, and our theorem. So the idea is that you want to take uh, uh, intersection over all those sets. So you want to take F to be the, the function that is uh, the curve that is, well, the, the matter curve, or the curve that is uh, made out of the powers of, uh, of, of uh, X. And you want to take uh, all of them. So you have uh, curves um, in every, in RD for every D, but then you take the inverse image of badly approximable vectors. So you get, uh, you get countably many uh, sets in the real line. And those are rather uh, large sets. Well, they have house of dimension one, according to what uh, Victor's, Victor proved. And, but then it doesn't, it still doesn't mean that you can take intersection over all those sets. So, so what we proved is uh, we improved on those, on those uh, previous works of uh, Berasnevich and uh, Le Young. Uh, and we showed that uh, this set, this, this type of set, the, the inverse image of the badly approximable vectors are actually uh, larger than, uh, than it was previously uh, possible to prove. So our method uh, allow, allowed us, uh, was more flexible and it allowed us to prove uh, uh, a bit more about how large this, that, that set is. So, so this is also the, this improvement of, of lay on top of uh, uh, the of Victor's work is also was also a step in the way, so he also proved a bit more about how large this set is. And in the end, uh, our work allowed to take countable 
prove that it is so large, well, it's, it still measures zero set, but it is um, a winning set, so it's possible to take countable intersections. Uh, so here, let me show you some of the heuristic. Um, so these are all the rational uh, lines that uh, intersect the unit uh, square with height smaller than one. So it's basically uh, lines of slope one, lines of slope minus one, and, uh, and zero as well. Um, but it becomes more complicated when you add the uh, lines of slope two. Uh, uh, and so on. So it becomes more and more complicated. And, and, and really the problem of approximation with the uh, rational lines is about uh, taking the uh, neighborhoods of those lines. So you have, uh, you have um, dense, a dense collection of, of lines but then you take uh, neighborhoods of those lines that are that shrink according to the height, well, to the uh, coefficients of the line. And then our problem is about uh, the parabola. So you put the parabola in, inside this square and you want to say um, uh, that um, the, the intersection of those neighborhoods of lines with the parabola is not everything. Uh, actually, it leaves a lot. So. Okay, so I'll start describe, uh, describing um, what is the, the main step and the main uh, simplification uh, over uh, Badziachin Velani Velani's work. So, in Badziachin Velani's work, the, the basic uh, the basic es estimate that uh, you start with when you analyze uh, what is the part that is covered by from of the parabola that is covered by rational lines neighborhoods of rational lines is uh, that if you have uh, let's say uh, a point close to a rational uh, line on the parabola. Let's say it satisfies uh, this kind, this type of inequality. Then a nearby point um, also satisfies, uh, also um, well. Then the, the, the neighbor, this this neighborhood of the of the line covers actually more than just this point. It covers uh, a, a neighborhood of, uh, of uh, those points, uh, which are close to x, x zero not x not and x not squared. Um, but here, here the main um, the main point in this estimate is that as, um, the, the larger this derivative is, well, uh, the larger this derivative is, it cannot be larger than, uh, than the height. So it cannot be larger than the maximum or some constant times the maximum between maximum of Q and, and R. Uh, but it might be smaller. So if it, if it was smaller, uh, the smaller it is, so it means that the, the line is uh, very close to be to being uh, uh, a tangent to the parabola. Then uh, a small neighborhood around around this uh, rational line will cover a lot of the parabola. So the main the main point uh, the main simpl simplify and then what what Bazar and Velani did is uh, they try to make this analysis uh, very carefully how, um, so you have two relevant quantities. One is the maximum between Q, absolute value of Q and R, which is the height of the, of the rational line. And also you have this uh, quantity, which is the, 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 this kind of derivative at the point. So they were trying to, uh, they are uh, 
following uh, well uh, both these quantities and then making the analysis very uh, a very careful analysis uh, uh, considering uh, both these uh, quantities and and uh, somehow I think uh, I don't have time to finish this thing but okay I have uh, I'll take another one minute uh, just to say that uh, the main step is is to forget some of this information. So uh, in, instead of uh, remembering that all that, uh, well, the set that you're trying to avoid is uh, neighborhoods of, of uh, lines, you just uh, uh, keep the information about the measure of the, that the of, about the measure that uh, you have to remove. So, um, I'll just uh, have to jump to here. Um, okay, this was this was not uh, didn't plan this right, but. Uh, this is the, the type of, uh, of a measure estimate uh, that replaces uh, uh, the analysis of uh, how large uh, of um, the, 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 the collection of all the, all the neighborhoods of lines that you have to remove and uh, you, only, you only remember uh, the measure of the, of the bed set that you have to remove and then um, the analysis become become much simpler, but uh, okay. Th thank you for listening. Uh, I will have this uh, slides uh, on my website or something like this, uh, so you, you can. Thank you, Erez. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? I have a question if in the end your result is a, it's just an existence result, yeah? Or can you say anything? Like, can you give an example of a number? No, I cannot give an example, but yeah, we, we, do, we do prove uh, a lot more than existence. We prove uh, that, this, this, that there are many uh, uh, bad approximable, uh, well, numbers that are bad approximable by algebraics. Uh, uh, the host of dimension of this of this set is is one, for example. Uh, it's a winning set, and uh, but they cannot give an explicit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. I mean, let's say you throw in uh, another transcendental or something. Um, like what? If you're trying to avoid. Yeah, if you're trying to avoid the. Uh, any other uh, small set? I mean, you're trying to to find badly approximable numbers that are branch breaks that are that also satisfy some other properties. So, so yeah, you might you might you might have uh, good chances to find uh, such a numbers. Of course, you can you can eliminate uh, counting the numbers. You can also find such a number in, in the Cantor set, for example, in the middle third the Cantor set. So this is also an, an outcome of what we, of our method. Um, maybe so uh, stop share. maybe we should take a five minute break, so. Uh, the mice has time to, sorry, six minutes, right? Or something like that? Yeah, six minutes. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, so the mice, I will make you yes. co host and I'll take a short break. Thank you. 
zu stellen. Wie das? das kann ich mir doch nicht. So does sound work? Can you understand? Yes, me? yes, we can. Yes. Okay, fine. Or you can see the screen. Ah, can you? Wait, can you? Can you see? Uh, wait, no, wait. Uh, this was what I wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, okay, it doesn't work. Okay. So we're supposed to start at uh, I, I, yeah, I, I 15, right? And the, yes. And the plenary station starts at 5. So right, this, the talk is supposed to end at quarter or two, and then we have some time for questions. And yep. Maybe yep, yep. Enough time for people to run over to the plenary session. Yes. Yeah, the fun thing is I don't have to change uh, the colors of this presentation if I give it again because uh, corporate design of, of Passau University has the same orange as Beersheba. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Jeremiah Seppanlein, uh, a team now uh, from Ben Gurion University, and I think currently in Passau. We'll uh, talk about, okay. Yeah, I uh, talk about the iterated Minkowski sums, or maybe more better Minkowski products, and the uh, horribles, and the uh, north south dynamics, and uh, a few other things. And because this is uh, the last talk in the session, I will start. 
uh, with an animation of uh, what this, this talk is about and uh, also some stuff that you have seen in the news most probably in the, in the last half year and uh, but first of all uh, thanks for the organizers that uh, it is possible to to actually take part here also from Germany and uh, that uh, I have the opportunity to present my work here and uh, so you get bonus points if you recognize this graph we start with a with a graph as nodes and edges and uh, we, we take a subset of this graph so that there are 10 red dots here that you will see in a second better and now uh, in every time step we add to our set all its neighbors so we just let our uh, red disease spread throughout the city and as, as we saw uh, in the news uh, eventually somewhere in the future everybody will be sick and uh, our uh, whole uh, city will be red but since uh, we started doing this uh, before uh, everybody talked about uh, corona we won't do this on uh, city maps but on uh, calligraphs so let's uh, recap our uh, scenario so we uh, have a finitely generated infinite group g and we take a generating set a that uh, contains the unit of the group is finite and generates g as a semi-group so it's every uh, element of g can be uh, represented as a product of uh, elements in a and we don't necessarily assume that a is symmetric and now we want to have a, a topological space so we take the uh, power set of g and think of these uh, elements as uh, zero one valued functions from two and uh, we end up with a product topology or let's say with a topology of uh, pointwise convergence and since g is infinite uh, countably infinite we get a, a nice contour space and now we have a map from x to itself we denoted by phi a because it depends on this generating set and it takes a subset of g and ret returns all possible products between m and the generating set so it takes it adds all neighbors uh, in the Cayley graph and since a is, uh, is a finite set this is a continuous map and uh, in order to understand uh, all the other pictures that I will show we, we start with an example again so we take a g as uh, z square a is uh, this subset of the plane so it has uh, nine elements and always uh, black squares will be uh, will be uh, elements in, in this set and then we take some subset of uh, of the plane and then we, we iterate our map and what happens is just every uh, uh, every pixel turns into this generating set and we continue like this and again everything converges uh, against the whole group and now to every pair of, of a group and the generating set we can associate such a system and the question is what kind of properties of the group or the generating set can we recover if you're only given this thing as a, as a topological dynamical system and to make this precise we uh, fix the following notation so if i have two topological dynamical systems phi one and phi two and if there exists a surjective map uh, psi from x1 to x2 that makes this uh, diagram commute we say that this system downstairs is a, is a factor of the one upstairs and if this psi is even a homomorphism then we say okay these, these systems are isomorphic or uh, in other words topologically conjugate and we denote it uh, like this okay and we say that uh, a property of our group uh, together with the generating set is dynamically recognizable let's say among a certain set of groups if for all pairs of groups g1 g2 from this uh, set of groups and positive generating sets a1 a2 if one of them has the property and the corresponding systems are topologically conjugate then the other uh, one also must have this property and what we can show is that the following uh, properties are dynamically uh, recognizable so amenability uh, the growth type of the group so if it's uh, exponential growth uh, polynomial growth or intermediate um, the exponential growth rate let's say among free groups or uh, hyperbolic groups and in case of uh, if you look at groups of the form zd then we can recognize rank so the d and the volume of the convex hull um, 
So how do we do this? Um, basically, these are all, in a certain sense, related to growth of, of balls or in a, of, uh, like for, for amenability. It's, it's about the, uh, the size of, of boundary of sets. And so somehow we wanted to measure the cardinality of sets. But uh, our conjugacy doesn't have to respect this. We only ask it to uh, commute with the, with the dynamics. And uh, so it might map uh, pretty uh, large sets to, to smaller sets and, and so on. So we need some kind of substitute uh, how we measure uh, the cardinality of a set. So what we do is we, we look at the following quantity. So we uh, take a set M and apply our, apply our uh, dynamics for, for K steps. So we make it uh, fatter. And then we look at all the sets N that have after, that after K time steps look the same. So for example, we start with, let's say this set, uh, apply our map two times, so we end up here. And then we look at all the sets that uh, also end up here after two, two steps. And these are uh, these eight sets. And I mean, this should be roughly something like uh, the power set of M. So it's, it's natural to take uh, the log of this cardinality. And this should give us something like the size of M. Now, as we already see here, I mean, we, we get eight such sets. Uh, if you take log two bases two, we get three. And none of these sets actually has cardinality three. So for example, uh, if we start with this, I think this has cardinality six. So you, you really have to take this roughly. So it's, it's the same order of magnitude, let's say. And this is also only true for fat M in the sense that uh, if I apply my map uh, many times to, to uh, such a set, then uh, the, the approximation gets better. And you, we will see that the precise estimates on the next slide. And uh, then we can study the growth of, uh, of this function. So we want to study uh, the growth of uh, our map applied to m n times. And uh, instead of measuring the cardinality of that, we apply L, uh, a kn for a suitable kn. So, um, but first of all, we somehow have to dynamically characterize the, the finite subsets of, of G such that uh, we actually can, can make uh, estimates here. And we, we can do it like this. So if we um, take our set M and go R plus N steps in the future and then R steps back and look at all possible paths at this uh, point in time. And if there are only uh, finitely many of these for all Rn, then we know that M is a finite set. It's, it's very easy to see that if M is finite, then this must also be a finite quantity. What's a little bit harder to show is that if you're infinite, then for uh, sufficiently large R and N, this also uh, becomes infinite. And now we want to have bounds for uh, this LA of, of uh, phi R of M in terms of the, the size of, of uh, uh, phi R of M. And the lower bound is actually pretty easy. So you, you take a, a enlarged uh, version of M, let's say, and then, so you take uh, like the, the R ball around uh, each element of M, and then you uh, remove all the R minus one balls. So you have some, some like, like a sphere left. And then if you add any uh, subset of the R, uh, minus one all around M back to this and go many steps to the future and go equal amount back, you will see that uh, you will end up at the same point. So this, this lower bound is actually pretty easy. And for the upper bound, you look at uh, such a set S R A M. And these are all elements of the group whose such that the R ball centered at V is contained at uh, this thickened version of M. And it's clear that all uh, sets that we are counting here must be subsets of this. And then we take log two. So, so the upper bound is also pretty obvious. The only question is how large can this set be? And how does this depend on R? And does it actually give us a good approximation of the, the size of, of, of this set? And there we come to dead ends in groups. And this is definition due to uh, Bogopolsky. And the dead end in the group is uh, 
uh, element of the, let's say, n sphere around the origin. So you take, you, it has, must have a uh, distance n from the origin. And it doesn't have neighbors in uh, the n plus one sphere. So all its neighbors, like all elements in GA, are also contained in a n ball, right? So if you, you think of, you, you run away from the origin and your, your pursuers are one step behind, then you're, you're really like in a movie in a dead end and uh, they got you. you. You cannot escape, you have to, you have to go back. And the, the amount that you have to go back, uh, this is called the dead end depth. So it's the maximum of, uh, of, of uh, this set. So it's just uh, the distance from, from G to uh, the complement of the A and ball minus one. And if G only contains finitely many dead ends, then for a sufficiently large n and all r, this r shelf or hull, as we called it, actually is just uh, gives, gives just gives you uh, back this set. So if you look back one slide, uh, this term actually just disappears, right? This sa, and you only are left with with this, and so you this actually uh, is upper bounded by uh, the size of uh, phi of n. This is precisely what we need. But uh, in general, you can expect to have only many, finitely many dead ends. For uh, abelian groups, uh, like the D, you, you only have finitely many dead ends. It's something that Leonard showed. But in, often it's enough that you have uh, bounded dead end depth. So if it's bounded by C, then what you get is that this R sheltered hall of AN is actually contained in AN, uh, A to the power of N plus C. And for all these asymptotic estimates, that's uh, still enough. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, here, this does not depend on R. So this means if I increase R, these sets get larger and larger. And since they're all contained in here, they must stabilize at one point. Now we see that if you have bounded that and depth, then uh, these sets must stabilize for uh, holes here. And we know, for example, that for the, the Heisenberg group, the standard generators, uh, this does not stabilize. It grows with uh, growing R if we take uh, N equals two here, if we take the two ball in the Heisenberg group and we take the R shell total for uh, increasing R, these, these sets get larger and larger. But uh, the, the Heisenberg group uh, has unbounded that end depth. So one might suspect maybe this is equivalent, but uh, in the lamplighter group, uh, we also have unbounded dead end depth, but here uh, we have stabilization of these shelter results. So it's, um, it's an interesting question um, when this actually happens. But these estimates are enough for, for the growth and to get, for example, the volume of the convex hull uh, in, the, in the ZD case. For amenability, uh, you need slightly different and, and harder estimates. And you, you can characterize amenability uh, by such a limit. So if you have a sequence uh, mn of finite subsets such that <laughs> the limit of this quotient goes to one, um, then you're amenable. And this is, if you are amenable, you can just take a formal sequence. And if you have such, uh, such a sequence fulfilling this condition, um, then a thickened version of uh, mn will actually be a firm sequence. Okay, but all this uh, information is only about, uh, let's say, uh, the, the volume of, of your generating set somehow. It doesn't give you any information about the shape. And this is what we come next. So we look at horribles and the eventual image. And uh, horribles are something that arises very naturally here. Um, so if you look at the, the subset of balls, so subsets of the form G A to the N, if uh, A is symmetric, these are really uh, the balls and the Cayley graphs. Um, they clearly form an in forward invariant subset, uh, subsystem. So if I apply my map to such a ball, I just get the ball with radius one bigger, but it's not a closed subsystem. And uh, the new sets that arise in the closure, besides the empty set and the, the whole set, are called horror balls. So this is a notion that comes from hyperbolic geometry and was introduced uh, by Gromov to this context. For example, if I uh, take again this double plus uh, generating set and now take uh, larger and larger balls with respect to this generating set and always 
center them so that the, the left vertex is at the origin. This converges to uh, like this rotated quarter plane. And it's not, ah, okay. And, and for, for these examples, we, we get precisely 12 hollow balls. And they all correspond to phases of uh, the convex hull of our generating set. So we get six for uh, the six vertices of the convex hull. And for every uh, like edge, we also get one. We already saw, uh, saw this one. And if we now center, let's say, at, at this vertex, always we get uh, this horrible. And we also get these, uh, like this half, half plates. And this is always true in, in ZD that uh, you have a one to one correspondence between the horribles and uh, the faces of your uh, convex hull. And now, if you look at the eventual, eventual image, which is defined like this, so it's uh, the maximal um, subset of your space where you are uh, surjective, um, these are precisely all unions of horribles. So you take an arbitrary number of these, these horribles that I showed you in, in the example, and then you take union of them and you get something in the eventual image. And now you, uh, you, you get a compact space again, and it's a subset of the contour space, but it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. So it doesn't have to be a contour uh, space itself. It can have isolated points. And if you look at the following examples, so these are three uh, generating sets. Um, this one has uh, three points in, in the convex hull. This one has uh, five points in the convex hull, and this one like, is a square. And you look at the, the Cantor Bendixson rank of the uh, corresponding eventual image. In this case, you get zero, here you get one, and here you get omega zero. So this means here, in the first case, our uh, eventual image is actually perfect. So this doesn't have isolated points. In the second uh, image, you get isolated points, but if you remove them, uh, contour set remains. And in the last um, example, you uh, can remove the isolated points, but the new space again has isolated points, and you have to remove them uh, omega zero times. And if you then take the intersection, you remain with something perfect. And the difference between these sets actually is that um, if you uh, basically take the convex hull, fix a vertex, um, move the convex hull so that it's in an origin, and then really scale it up and take the union over all these scalings. You end up with this, with this sector here. And you do this for all three vertices. You get these three sectors. And what you see is that uh, they don't cover the, the whole plane. You have these, these empty sections here. And if you have something like that, then uh, you end up with uh, is a perfect uh, eventual image. If you do the same thing here for all five vertices, then uh, these sectors uh, cover the whole plane. And if you move, move one of them, uh, you get, you get an, an basically an empty sector. You, so you, to cover the whole plane, you also need all of them. And in the last example, you again cover everything. But if you move them slightly out, like these, these gymnases start to appear. And this uh, is responsible for um, giving you contour bendix and omega, omega zero. Now, we conjecture that at least in the abelian case, these are the only possibilities. But already proving that for, uh, for C is, is uh, somewhat technical. And uh, we, we don't have the proof of, of, in the, of the general case. OK, so we saw that if we go uh, to the uh, surjective part of our map, we, we still can recover some information. And now the question is maybe uh, if we go one step further and somehow make our map uh, in injective, we, we still uh, remember something of our, our group in the beginning. So we, what we do is we go to the natural extension. So um, this is just we take all uh, sequences of states that are compatible with our uh, dynamics. So basically all possible uh, histories of our world. And on, on this space, we also have a map, which is just induced by, by our original map. And it's just the shift in this case, right? We, we just shift history by one time step. And it's, it's clearly an extension of uh, the restriction to the eventual image. And it's, uh, the map here becomes a homeomorphism because it's just a shift. And it's a very simple one. It's, uh, 
what's called uh, MOS ex exhibits what's called uh, MOS Faust dynamics. So it, uh, in forward time, converges to uh, everything is included in, in uh, at all time points. And uh, in, in backward times, it converges to empty set at every time point. Right? So you have one attracting fixed point and one repelling fixed point, and they uh, basically uh, the repelling fixed point. Uh, repels everything that's not uh, the attracting fixed point and the attracting fixed point attracts everything that's not the repelling fixed point. And you can ask yourself how many of such systems are there on the contour set and Levitt proved that on the contour set you actually have up to topologically, uh, topologically conjugacy only one such system. Um, this is can be different for, for uh, other spaces but what remains to show then for us is uh, that for uh, our interesting case that the space, the natural extension is actually counter set, so we, we have to show that it's perfect. And then um, we can use this result to, to deduce that at this point, uh, we cannot recover anything about our um, generating set or the, the D in uh, ZD that we started with, because it doesn't matter what D or what generating set we put in, uh, we always get no star system on the counter space and they are all topologically conjugate. And I want to uh, sketch the proof of this result now. So um, remember that in ZD we have a one to one correspondence between the faces of the convex hull and the AHOR balls. And then it's very easy to see that finite unions of vertex horror balls are dense. So what do I mean by vertex horror balls? These are the horror balls corresponding to vertices of the convex hull. Right? Like in this uh, example that we saw, we had 12 horror balls and uh, six of them corresponded to vertices. Now to show that uh, our natural extension is perfect, what you actually have to do, if you think a little bit about this, is we start with uh, something in the eventual image, call it M, and then we have to find the natural number N and uh, two, subs, uh, two yeah, states W1 and, and W2 such that uh, if we apply phi n to both of them, they're actually close to m. So we have to approximate m by uh, phi n and w and, and phi n w2, and then we have to find two potential paths that are different from each other, and then uh, only one of, one of them can agree with m, and then we, we found a, a point that is very close in the uh, in the natural extension and differs from uh, the one that belongs to M. And uh, this showed that we are perfect. So how do we do this? Well, we know that finite unions of vertex or balls are dense, so we approximate M by finding union of vertex or balls. We can write it like this. So we have a union of, um, so this stands for horrible and it corresponds to some vertex and then it's shifted somewhere. It's only a finite union. And what happens if we apply our map to, to this uh, union? Well, all the, Horribles, if you make the calculation, move in the direction of the corresponding vertex. So we just add vi here. So we want to go to the past. So what we do is we subtract, whoop, we subtract this vector uh, n times. And now we can check if we apply our dynamics n times, we, we end up precisely with our approximation of m. Now, what does this set look like? Um, and to, to understand this, we, we scale it by one divided by n. So this means if we take then the limit, these wi, the original translations, they disappear. The n's here cancel out, so we end up with minus yi here. And the horror balls, if we scale them down, they actually converge against their uh, convex hull. So we will see this in a, in a movie now. So we, we start with uh, something in the eventual image. So remember, black. Um, Black is uh, the elements that are included in our set. And okay, I can only draw what, what I see in a, in a finite window. So for example, we have one, one horror ball that's, that's centered here and one here, here, two over here and two over here and then one here. And let's uh, see what happens if we go back in time, like uh, move all of them in each time step by, by minus vi. So, Everything moves out. And let's see. What we end up with 
is uh, precisely um, all the horror balls more or less at uh, at minus vi. So uh, I, I try to draw on this, but uh, maybe maybe it's, it works now. Maybe uh, wait. No, I don't. I, I don't have annotate here. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a funny feature of these originals. Ah, yeah. So, so somehow I can I cannot annotate. Um, what what you see is is these six uh, points here more or less correspond to uh, the uh, convex hull of, of our generating set, and then at each of these points, or or minus this this convex hull, and and at each of these points you have. Uh, the corresponding horror ball. And now we can just modify the past. So we just cut off this, this uh, vertex here by, by another horror ball. And then we uh, let time run again in the right direction. So how do I get rid of this here? Maybe like this. Okay. And then you see if we go in, in forward time again, our, our modification disappeared and we end up with the same, oh, with the same, ah, let's see. No, I'm too slow. With the same set we started with. So the, the idea is uh, you, you take a set, you, you go back in, in, in time in, a, in a one, one possible past, you modify the past, and you, if you modify, uh, because we know how, how the past looked like, if you, if you scale it, and, uh, of course, in general, you, you need some, some estimates that's really that your, your modification disappears in time, but that's the idea behind it. And I want to finish. Three minutes, yes, perfect. Um, with uh, some questions that originally motivated us to, to consider these systems, namely factoring. So we talked about when these systems are conjugate or when they are not conjugate. And now the question is, when does one of these systems factor onto the other? Um, and to make it very precise, thus the two-dimensional system with uh, like the square as, as generators factor onto the one-dimensional system with this uh, minus one zero one interval. Uh, thing. And we have we've been thinking about this question for two years, and it's somehow we we are uh, we we switched our opinion a lot if if there should be a factor map or not. So some some hints. Uh, that there should be a factor map. So if we replace the z here by, by the natural number, so if you take like the one-sided version of this, then you get a factor map and it's, it's an easy exercise to construct this. We, we don't have a factor map in the, in the other direction so that it's good somehow this, this behaves like it, like it should. You, the one-dimensional uh, system does not factor on the two-dimensional system. And this you just get by looking at the uh, eventual image because this one is countable and this one here is, is uncountable and you cannot map a countable set onto an, an uncountable set. And if you restrict to the eventual image, then the two-dimensional system does factor onto the one-dimensional system. Um, but somehow this, this factor map uh, seems not to extend to, to one that uh, really gives a factor map between the two-dimensional, the whole two-dimensional system to the one-dimensional system. Um, there are a few other questions. For example, we don't have yet an example of uh, two different groups that give uh, topologically conjugate um, systems here. So it could be possible that you can recover the whole group and up to maybe some automorphism, even the generating set. It's most probably unlikely, uh, but uh, we, we don't have an example. Um, and then there is this question, It'll, all the horror balls we saw are actually increasing unions of balls. And this, like, this is true in, in ZB, that every horror ball is, is an increasing union of, uh, of balls. But it's not clear that this is true in general. But uh, I'm also not aware of any counterexample to this in the, uh, in the literature. And in particular, um, must it be true that every horror ball is a connected subset of the Killy graph? Um, it's false for graphs. If you, if you, I mean, you can do this whole thing. It only basically uses a graph, as we saw in the beginning. And in, in graphs, you can have disconnected horror balls, but these uh, examples don't look like uh, Cayley graphs. And so maybe it's 
possible that in a very weird group, um, you have disconnected horribles. Would be very interested in this. Thanks for the attention. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions from the audience? So about isomorphism, you mean kind of two groups that give conjugate systems for non-trivial reasons. Like, you know, you can have two groups that have the same Cayley graph, right? Like, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, for, for non-trivial reasons, yes. <laughs> I mean, this is a little bit, bit unfair to ask for non-trivial reasons because every time you get an example, then you claim it's the trivial reason. But that's safe, that's, that's what you should do. Yes, yes, you're right. This is what I should say. Okay. Okay. There are and no more let's, questions. Let's run to the. Let's thank all the speakers and the, the plenary session. Right, starts at five. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for organizing.